How many people can hear me? I can. You can hear me? How many can hear me now? So the human ear has a tremendous range over which it can hear sounds. I think the range goes something like 20,000, 20,000 factor of 10 to the fourth in terms of intensity. But when I speak right now, and when I speak right now, you know, what's the difference? Your ears are not sensitive to intensity. Turns out they are, in, they are sensitive to the log of intensity. Something that you perceive as twice as loud is actually a much larger fraction of intensity. All right? And the way we see that is something called the sound level. And the sound level, the text uses the symbol beta, is equal to 10 times the log of base 10 of the intensity of the sound divided by some reference intensity. And this reference intensity is 10 to the minus 12 joules per second per meter squared. OK? So that's the way intensity is measured. So how much energy per second per meter squared? All right? And we use the base. 10 for this, and uh, the factor of 10. Where does this reference energy intensity come from? It comes from the fact that you, probably not me, can hear sounds at an intensity of around 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared. It's pretty low. So when we have that intensity, we let i zero, i equal that, we get one. What's the log of one? Zero. So the log of one is zero. And so the smallest intensity sound level, rather the lowest sound level you can hear is zero in this case. And this is called decibels. All right, so you can hear zero decibels. Ordinary conversation like what I'm doing now is around 60 decibels, but it can go much higher. All right? Notice that the intensity is proportional to the amplitude of the sound wave squared. Now, somebody in the, in the last class asked, why is that? And the reason comes from the fact that for a spring, we know that the energy is 1 half k x squared. And if it's oscillating, you would have 1 half k a squared sine squared, let's say omega t. When we average this thing over some period, it turns out the average of sine squared is about a half, and so the energy is proportional to the amplitude squared. So since waves are built out of a whole bunch of harmonic oscillators, basically, the same will be true for a wave. All right? So the intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared. All right. Now humans not only hear various intensities, but they hear certain frequencies better than others, particularly older people like myself. So I apparently cannot hear 
very high frequency sounds that you can hear. You can actually hear sounds that I cannot hear. Dogs can hear higher frequency sounds than people. Okay. So there are a couple applications of that fact. One I heard of is a bunch of students wanted to speak during class. And they didn't want the professor to hear, so they set up a microphone system that gave out sounds at a very high frequency, and the professor couldn't hear it, even though the students could hear it. So that I view as a negative use of this fact. Now, a positive use from my point of view and a negative use from your point of view, this is a true fact, is that there was a store, like a neighborhood store, sort of like a 7-Eleven type thing in Britain. And there were a bunch of teenagers hanging around the store and driving away the customers to the store. So the owner decided to put out a speaker that put out sounds that were extremely annoying but very high frequency so that only teenagers could hear it. And that got rid of the teenagers. They left. And the store now had its customers back. All right, so it's a real, real effect. You can see it. All right, so logarithms are very important. When we talk about uh, thermodynamics, or more properly, statistical mechanics, we'll see logarithms again. All right, they have some good properties that you probably know, like the log of A times B equals the log of A plus the log of B. Or the log of A over B equals the log of A minus, minus the log of B. Okay, so those are some properties that are useful. All right. So this is what's called the sound level. All right. So a very big increase in intensities only leads to a relatively small change in the sound level in terms of decibel. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two other topics today. First is the Doppler effect. All right, I'm going to go into a little detail about how that works. And the second is uh, the wave equation. All right, and go into that a little bit. All right, about five years ago, I was doing an exercise, a stretching exercise, that was supposed to prevent he headaches. Take a towel. I don't recommend this, by the way. You take a towel, you wrap it around your head, and you go like this with the towel. So I did that, and I must have did it a little too tightly because I fainted. I actually fainted. I fell for, you know, and then when I fell and hit the ground, I woke up. Okay? So I wasn't too badly hurt. And I smashed the window that I was next to, but that, that, that was replaced. But I told my doctor about this, and he was concerned. So he decided to do a test on me. And the test he did took ultrasound, sound waves, into my neck. He, he had them go, uh, they were or pointed at my neck. And then he looked at the reflections from the neck. So there's a device that does that. And he was able to determine the blood flow frequency, uh, velocity in my neck. How did he do that? So that's what we're going to answer. He used the Doppler effect. The sound waves were absorbed by the blood and then re-emitted 
by the blood, and then he looked at the re-emitted sound waves to see whether they were shifted in frequency and how much they were shifted due to the velocity of the blood. Okay, so that's one use of the Doppler effect. It's a very effective use because you don't, it's non-invasive. You don't have to put any needles in somebody's head to do that. So how does the Doppler effect work? Doppler effect. All right, so here's the key idea. You have a train, here's your train, and let's say it's moving in that direction with velocity v. All right, I'm going to give it a, a little symbol s standing for source. So this is the velocity of the source. All right, and this train is putting out waves, sound waves. So if it was stationary, if the velocity is zero, it would put out waves like this. So this is the peak pressure, then another peak pressure, another peak pressure, another peak pressure, et cetera. So these are peak pressures. All right, so this is the case where Vs equals zero. We can measure a wavelength here would be this wavelength here. That would be lambda. All right, now let's do the case Vs not Vs greater than zero. All right, so it's moving in this direction. And here's the listener. Listeners over here, can I, well, draw it over here. All right, there's an ear. How's that? There's the ear. Here's the train. So it puts out a wave, and the first guy goes like that. Then mo this moves over. The next guy, instead of moving, going this amount, because the train has moved a little bit, the next guy is not at this distance. It's actually closer to this. So it's over more like that. It's closer. And if this is a constant velocity, then the waves would be all like that. And we call that lambda prime. So how much closer is it? How does this differ from this? And we have a certain velocity, Vs. To answer that, how often is this peak put out by this guy? How often? So you put a peak out, then another peak comes, and another, and another. What's the time between peaks? What do we call that? What? Period. OK? So this lambda prime here will equal lambda minus v sub s times t. It's going to be smaller, right? Because every period, every t seconds, there'll be a new peak coming out, right? Because the sound waves oscillate like that. So now we can use this to do some analysis. All right. So we have lambda prime equals lambda minus Vst. How's the period related to the frequency? One over it, right. So this is lambda minus Vs times 1 over f. All right? But we also have this result for waves, hopefully you remember, f lambda equals the velocity of the wave. All right? Everybody remember that? You probably also saw it in high school. All right? So we can replace f, so we have lambda minus Vs, and place f by V over lambda. So we get lambda over V, and we get this result, lambda times 1 minus Vs over V. All right, so that's how the wavelength changes. Now when we're talking about sounds, and in a lot of other contexts, we're not, we don't usually measure wavelength, we talk about frequency. 
right? So we can change lambda prime equals the velocity of the wave over f prime. And I do the same here. I have velocity over f times 1 minus vs over v. All right, so I just put that in there. I replaced lambda here by v over f, lambda prime by v f prime. So solve for f prime. And what do I get? I get f prime equals 1 over, uh, I, it's equal to f divided by 1 minus vs over v. Okay. So in this case, the train is moving towards the observer, right? And what happens to the frequency? Does the frequency go up or down? Is the, this is the observed frequency. This is what you hear. This is what was put out. Is the observed frequency higher or lower? Higher. Right? Because Vs is positive the way I wrote it there. I used Vs greater than zero. All right? So the denominator is smaller, the frequency goes up. And that's what happens. Train coming towards you, its frequency will go up. It'll go from, let's say, ooh to ee, something like that. So that's, that's what it is. I encourage you to look for trains with whistles. So you can see this effect. The train is moving away from you. What's going to happen? Does the frequency still go up or does it go down? Down. Why? Well, because Vs essentially becomes negative. And then you have a plus sign there. And that's because if this was the speed here, all right, these waves would, instead of being closer together, they'd be further apart. Right, so the wavelength increases, the frequency decreases. So that is one part of the Doppler effect. Now let's look at another aspect. What happens if the source is stationary, but the observer is moving? All right, so let's do that case. So now we're going to look at the source is stationary, but the observer moves. So here's the source and stationary, Vs equals zero. It's putting out waves like this. All right? And here's the observer. Let's see, draw that here. And it's moving the observer. So we use a positive if it's moving towards the source. So what's going to happen here? Well, we can't do it exactly the same way, but what we can do is realize the following. What is the velocity of the wave? Well, we just use what's called Newtonian relativity. So the actual velocity is not the velocity of the wave, but it's the velocity of the wave plus v0. Right? Because it's moving fast. The, the source is moving. All right? Now, how many people here have been on a train? Been on a train? Not everybody? Hopefully you've all been on a train. Maybe even a bus. How many have been on a bus? Raise your hand if you've been on a bus. All right. OK, if I'm driving on a bus and I look out the window and I see another bus driving at the same speed, how fast is that bus moving relative to me? Zero. It's not moving at all if we're both moving at the same speed. But if one bus is moving relative to the other, it can be moving faster. Or another way of thinking about it, Let's say you're a crazy teenager standing up on a motorcycle, 
driving at a certain speed, let's say, I don't know, 30 kilometers per hour, and you happen to be a baseball player, and you throw a baseball from your motorcycle. How fast will that ball go? It'll go the speed of the motorcycle plus the speed of the baseball relative to the motorcycle. So that's all we're doing here. We're just saying the speed of the wave will now be its speed in a stationary medium plus v0, plus the velocity of the observer. All right, so then I do a similar kind of thing. I know f lambda equals v, so I have f prime is equal to this v, v plus v0 over lambda. All right? And we know that lambda is equal to, this is the wavelength in a stationary situation. It's just given by f over v. No, what is that? Lambda is v over f. And so I get f v plus v0 over v. Or f times 1 plus v0. So this expresses what happens if the observer moves towards you. And once again, I mean the observer moves towards the source, once again the frequency goes up if you're moving towards the source. So we have that effect as well. All right? Now notice they're not quite, they don't change in exactly the same way. This has 1 plus like that, and that has 1 over. If you put it together, both effects, let's say both the source and the observer are moving, then we ha can put it together. So both source and observer, then you get f prime equals f, and then I have 1 plus v0 over v divided by 1 minus Vs. So both of them can happen. So if the train is moving towards you and you start running rapidly towards it, it'll be the frequency will go up even more. Okay? And it's just important to remember that V0 being positive means the observer is moving towards the source, and Vs being positive means the source is moving towards the observer. So we use that convention in writing this formula down. I guess it's conceivable some textbook might use some other convention. So this is the whole thing. Now notice this, that formula, is for a constant velocity of the observer and the source. All right? So if the observer is speeding up, the frequency observed will change. It'll change with time. If the source is slowing down, it'll change with time. Only if they're constant will the frequency observed, heard, be the same with time. It won't change with time. OK. All right. So the Doppler effect is used. Uh, I gave you an example in a medical context. Its biggest use, however, is in, the, in light, using it with light waves. But light waves are a little weird compared to sound waves because there's no medium in a light wave. Light just goes through a vacuum. It doesn't require a medium. This really f was confusing to physicists in the 19th century. In fact, most of them thought there was a medium for light to move through. They realized light was a wave because it had a lot of effects that waves have. And so they called the medium the ether. Okay, so maybe some of you heard this. I don't know if you want to write this down because it 
doesn't exist, but all right, so 19th century physicists, light waved in a medium called the ether. And then two physicists, actually Americans, one of the few Americans doing physics in the, 19, in the late 1900s and early 20th century, Michelson and Morley, showed there was no ether. And how did they do that? They looked at the speed of waves going one way and no speed going the other way. And they knew the Earth was moving. And so, using the Doppler effect, they would expect that these waves would have different velocities. All right? They, if it was moving, if the wave was moving with the Earth, it would have a certain velocity. And if it was moving against the Earth, it would have a different velocity. All right? And they had two arms, one perpendicular to the other, and they let the waves interfere with each other. We'll talk about interference on uh, Monday. And they, these, you would get fringes, what they call interference fringes, and these would change as you rotated your apparatus because when it's in one configuration, one arm is moving with the Earth and the other may be perpendicular, and then as you rotate it, it'll change. And they saw nothing. Nothing changed, all right? So that was an historical fact. There's some debate other whether Einstein really knew of this or not, but if he did, it would have influenced how he thought about light. But he actually thought about it probably without knowing this result. All right, so why do I bring this up? Because we cannot do this calculation for light waves. So it turns out for light, the formula is slightly different. And this is true for other electromagnetic rays like gamma rays, x-rays, infrared, ultraviolet. They're all the same. You have f prime equals f, right? And if you want to make it look a little more like that. Okay. Notice there is no V observer. There is no V source. The only thing that's relevant is the relative velocity of the two. Because in the theory of special relativity, in Einstein's theory, you cannot tell the difference between whether I'm moving towards you or you're moving towards me. You can't tell the difference. And since there's no medium, the medium doesn't tell you the difference either. All right? So that whole idea of a medium that we use in sound is not valid in light. And V relative is positive if the uh, object, if the relative velocity is towards each other. So why is this so important in physics? Well, it's mostly important in astronomy because this is how we discovered that the universe is expanding, all right? So stars, galaxies, they put out light. How many of you have taken some chemistry? Do you know what happens when an atom or a molecule is excited and then it drops back down to uh, the ground state? What does it do? What happens? Light. It gives off light. And the light it gives off is at a very specific frequency. All right? So we can look for a spectral line, either hydrogen or helium, because that's what the universe is made up of. So when those atoms are excited and then drop down, they give off light of a particular frequency. 
And what we notice, so we see a whole bunch of lines corresponding to these different excited states. When the galaxy is moving away from us, those lines are red shifted. Okay, they're at lower frequencies, higher wavelengths. When the galaxies are moving towards us, they are blue shifted towards the blue end, higher frequencies, lower wavelengths. And what Hubble found out, all the galaxies are moving away from us. It's like saying, God, we're a very special galaxy. We're at the center of the universe, and everybody else is moving away from us. Of course, that's the wrong interpretation. All right, the right interpretation is that every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. So what we, the way we think of it is, imagine a balloon, and on the balloon you put a bunch of dots. As you expand the balloon, you blow it up, the dots move away from each other. Every dot moves away from every other dot. All right, so the universe is expanding, and we now take that as absolute fact. All right? Nobody disputes it. Space is getting bigger. Now, there are lots of subtleties, but that's the main thing. All right? So that's an incredibly important result of the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is also looked at uh, useful for identifying planets going around other stars. It's not the best way, but it's one way. So if a planet is going around a star, you can't see the planet. That's impossible. Planets, are, they don't give off much light. But what you do see is oscillations in the star's motion. All right? How do you see that? You see it by the Doppler effect. So when the star is oscillating a little towards you, or a little away, you'll see shifts in the spectral lines of the star. And you look at what's near the star, you don't see any other stars, or maybe you see a double star and you can figure out what the effect is, and what's left over is due to some other object. And you assume that object is a planet or more than one planet, in fact. So that was one of the first ways that planets were discovered around other stars. Uh, there are other ways that we discover planets around stars, and now, pretty much now, we believe that almost all stars have planets going. We weren't so sure about that like 20 years ago. 20 years ago, people didn't know if, they didn't know if they had discovered any planet around the star, but now we think almost every star has a planet around. And also, a lot of stars are double stars. That's pretty common. It is absolutely astounding how much more we know about the universe than we did even 20 minutes ago. 20, well, 20 minutes ago is probably true, too. 20 years ago. In order to understand the wave equation, I'm going to introduce a little bit of calculus that you may or may not have seen. But it's Pretty straightforward. So I'm going to introduce the concept of a partial derivative. OK? So let's say we have a function that's a function of all these things. And it could be many other things as well. So the partial derivative, which is, we use the symbol like that, delta. So let's say I want the partial derivative with respect to x. What that means is it's the same as it means take the derivative of f 
assuming, assuming y and z are constants. All right? That's all it is. It's pretty easy. So for example, let's say I had f equals x squared y z cubed. What would the partial of f with respect to x be? What would that be? So it'd be 2x y z cubed. Good. What would the partial of f with respect to y be? What would it be? Right. So it'd be just x squared z cubed. And the last one, partial of f with respect to z, would just be x squared y 3z squared. OK? That's a pretty straightforward idea. It's called a partial derivative. OK. So now we're going to apply that to the following function. All right? So let's apply to f of our good friend x minus vt. All right? So why am I using this? Because I told you that if uh, any function like that represents a wave, no matter what, it represents a wave. So this represents a wave moving to the right or to the left? To the right. OK, so this is a wave moving to the right. So I want to take the partial derivative of this. How do I do it? I have no idea what the function looks like. But I'm going to define u equals x minus vt. All right? And let's take the partial of f with respect to x. So what that's going to do, it's going to equal df du times du dx, right? And the reason why I use a total derivative here is because f of u is just one variable, u. So it's not more than one. So I have that. I have no idea what the f to u is. That depends on what the function is. So I can just write that. But what's the u dx? Partial u dx. What is that? One. So that's just one. All right, good. Now let's take the second derivative. All right, so that's the same idea. I take the derivative of this, so that's a partial with respect to x of df du. All right? So what does that equal? So it equals d by du df du times the partial of u with respect to x. Okay? So you take the derivative of this with respect to u times the u dx. What is this thing? Any ideas what that is? What is that thing? If I take a derivative and then I take a, another derivative, what do we call that? What? Yeah, it's the second derivative. I don't think we need the word order, OK? So it's the second derivative, which we write like this. And what's the u dx? 1. So we have that. All right. Now I want everybody to do the, find the second derivative. So this is what I want you to do.
find that. So follow the same strategy, but find the derivative with respect to t instead of x. So let's see you do it. Just follow what we got here. Just follow it and just replace x by t. That's all you got to do. And see what it is. So the answer is v squared, v squared u f du squared. So it's the same as this, except there's a v squared there. And that just comes back because the partial of u with respect to t is minus v. And you do that twice, you get minus v squared. But we know df du squared is the same as df dx squared. So we get v squared. All right, so this equation, this equation is called the wave. Okay? So that's the wave equation. Notice that this function will also work in here. Notice that this function, if I add two functions together, that'll also work. You can try it, and you'll see that it works. That comes about because the wave equation is said to be linear. So you can keep adding waves together, and they're all solutions. And we know that. We talked about that a little bit, that you can add a wave together to get it. And that's going to be crucial in our discussion on Monday, because we're going to be w adding waves together. So any combination of any functions of x plus or minus vt will, is a solution to the wave equation. But where does the wave equation come from physically? Well, the answer to that is a little more complicated. I'm not going to do it. There's a derivation of where it comes from for ropes in the text. You just calculate the forces on a rope segment, and you set it equal to ma, and you'll get, all right? So I, I suggest you look at the text to see that, in order to see where it comes from. In the case of sound waves, it's the same kind of thing. You take a piece of air or fluid, you calculate your pressure on both sides. We know how to do that. And we look at how that pressure, uh, and then we set that equal to something like ma, and then we'll also get the wave equation. So it just comes from a kind of calculation using Newton's laws. So that's how classical waves come about. The wave equation for electricity and magnetism comes about from the equations, so-called Maxwell's equations for electricity and magnetism. So you'll derive that next semester for uh, light waves. So you'll get that. OK. So that's where the wave equation comes from. It's very important. All waves follow the wave equation. OK. There are some other strange waves like things called solitons that have a nonlinear component. So like, uh, for example, tsunamis, I think, are not actual classical waves. They are nonlinear waves, and they follow a somewhat more complicated formula. But waves, like on a, you know, if you have a drum and you hit the drum, the waves on that follow the wave equation. Most, a lot of waves follow it. Thank you.